Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am an electronics engineer by education, and my first job in the Air Force in 1975, I needed to get a computer or a terminal and a microprocessor lab to do some 6800 code. And Tektronix introduced their 4051 microcomputer, complete computer in a single box, nothing like it. I got using it as a terminal and then said, let's learn basic because they didn't teach basic or any other programming <laughs> in college and began doing some basic programming and fell completely in love with the computer and basic and I still am in love with the computer and basic and so the 4054A is a second generation computer because I couldn't find the first one. The first one's another five years older so found this one uh, or one with a green screen in 2000 on eBay and a young man that had been at Caltech posted a 4054 for sale on eBay, starting price $7. And he said, it doesn't work. And it's like, okay, it doesn't work. And I asked the question, I said, when you turn it on, do you see anything? Hit this key, the page key is the orange key on the upper left, nothing. Well, I had to have it, won the auction, and I think I was bid up from $7 to 17 and so I drove from Houston to north of Oklahoma City to pick it up because he couldn't ship it. I mean, 150 pounds of meat. And drove up there in my Austin Mini Cooper with my son. And we pulled the front seats out in order to get this inserted sideways in the back seat. Took off, got it home. DRAM. Found some DRAM. We had a surplus store at the time still in there uh, in Houston, EPO, and picked up some DRAMs, dollar a piece. Began randomly swapping memory and it started working. There you go. My first acquisition. Uh, also have another one, which is the smaller brother to this one. And uh, that one, the 4052, broke a couple weeks ago, but prepping for this show, I said, no time to fix the 4052. Let's begin. The presentation is going to be on how does it work. And as a user of the computer, you really don't care that much about how it works inside, but you do care about how it works when it breaks. <laughs> and you are the repair person. So, in my case, my machine broke right before Christmas last year. <laughs> I was developing Cylon attack program, other things, and it's like, you got to be kidding me. So, the failure mode was... When I would turn on the computer, it's on instantly, has basic and ROM, bright orange spot in the middle. Uh, bad. It's going to burn the phosphor, turn the computer off. And so it's hard to debug a computer that you can't leave on but a couple of seconds. So I got my logic analyzer out, plugged it in, went to looking at the circuitry on what is turning on this dot? Well, it's actually the opposite. What isn't turning the dot off? But months later, after looking at every piece of digital logic, and there's over a dozen circuit boards, this is a discrete design. The original 4051 single board Motorola computer, 32K of RAM, so fairly straightforward. Tektronix, or the computer that I used in the Air Force at my first job, was a bit slow. Tektronix Basic 
only supports floating point, double precision floating point, because the target is business, commercial, scientific, math, and so integers they didn't care about. <laughs> <laughs> so floating point eight bytes the format that they had takes a bunch of memory as you build arrays of numbers and so uh, programming in basic it would run out of ram easy uh, this particular machine tektronix s motorola are you going to make faster 6800s we need them customers are demanding fast Motorola said, nope, we're just building other CPUs. We'll do a 6801, 6802, 6805, <laughs> all running a megahertz. This one ran, the original ran 800 kilohertz. It's like, you got to be kidding. So they decided, we'll build our own CPU. This has a bit slice, custom bit slice design by Tektronix engineers that provided 16 bits of data and address space got doubled. They did 64K of RAM, 64K of ROM, 64K of basic ROM. It's like they had a very complex basic and it was their design. And one of the things that it did that was different than other basic computers is it had support for IO on GPIB bus that had just been introduced in 75. And so that's an 8-bit parallel interface for peripherals. And Tektronix designed floppy drive systems, plotters, a hard drive system, all on GPIB, uh, a tape drive, second tape drive. So on the left is just the block diagram of the boards and cabling. It's like this beast, if I take the lid off in the picture, it's like it's got a hinged lid with the CPU boards is a stack of two sets of four boards behind that board in the front, ribbon cable together. I mean, it's quite a beast, but that isn't all. Down below on the other side of the CRT is a whole set of boards that comprise the display controller. It's like, mercy, this is complicated. Uh, so debugging it, it ended up a couple of those display boards that I was looking at in particular have big heat sinks on the back that you'd see looking at the back of my machine as like goodness. So you have to pull everything out to get to those boards. Couldn't find anything wrong. <sighs> what I knew was one of the boards in the display section, a high voltage power supply. 6,000 volts to the CRT. And I said, one, it's in a metal can. Labels going, this is dangerous, deadly. This will kill you. But that was where the problem was. High voltage power supply. It had two sections in it. And since Tektronix had been designing storage tube, uh, their own and building their own tubes, they had had decades of experience with the electronics design. The power supply itself looked very weird to me. I mean, one, there wasn't an ASIC going, yes, I'll do five volts. It's like, no, everything was from scratch. And so looking at the schematic in the high voltage power supply, it actually had intensity control. And I said, well, it looks like I got a hot spot. So maybe it's on the high voltage board. They had a ladder of resistors and diodes. And it's like, what in the hell does that do? I mean, digital logic, on or off. No, no, this is all analog domain. And so I really, even as an electronics engineer, it's like it'd been too long, I said, maybe I can use SPICE and take all the components, put it in. One, I had to learn SPICE because I hadn't used SPICE ever and put the components in trying to figure out tell me what voltages happen with these logic inputs so it had digital logic inputs but then it became analog on the intensity line it was like finally got it simulated didn't help at all all of those analog inputs look good but the output then becomes high voltage so it gets amplified to 
6,000 volts <laughs> oh, no. because the output goes to, it's in another picture, the tube has a filament, a cathode, and a 6,000 volt power supply. So in their design, instead of there being a lead on the CRT that's the high voltage and everything's low voltage coming in the end cap, no, we're putting that 6K right in the end of the tube. And because one, they've covered the CRT in steel. I can't get to anything on the CRT. It's like oh, 6,000 volts. The control grid that says on off of the beam is right by the riding gun. And I got a picture of this. The control grid power supply is hooked to the 6,000 volt power supply. I'm looking, they got spark gaps in case the voltage is too big to try to keep it, clamp it. The spark gaps were only a couple of hundred volt spark gaps hooked to the 6K volt line. And I'm going, it's deadly voltage for the control grid. How am I going to figure this out? Figured it out by <clears throat> removing the power supply after waiting a long time and beginning to take components off the board in the control grid section. And fortunately, the second one that I removed the lead on, so the diodes were first, they had a voltage doubler, then they had a resistor, 10 mega ohms. It's like my fluke wouldn't even give me a good reading on it. And so I got a mega ohm meter, and it was open circuit. <sighs> Okay, I need a carbon comp resistor because metal film resistors actually have some inductance. The designers put metal film some places. They didn't put it here. Half a watt, 10 meg. It was actually some good current. I think it was acting like a spark gap because there was video, I mean, display. Replace the resistor, back in business. It's like, <sighs> but you have to fix these things yourself. Uh, I had even contacted, we've got a uh, Tektronics engineer that had worked on this design, worked on that bit slice processor doing the microcode, still in Oregon at a museum they got at the now Danaher site or whatever, and asked him questions about the CRT and the design. And he says, Monty, it's been so long. I don't remember. But they are sitting on a gold mine of microfish for every Tektronics manual ever. And so I've asked them to scan and print, you know, send me PDF files of manuals. So we do have service manuals, complete operating manuals, all that. So that's the good news is I had the real design schematics. Uh, in 1970s, memory was quite expensive. And so what Tektronix did with this, which is totally different than what HP did uh, with their little microcomputer in the 70s, is use their storage tube technology. And so this presentation, I'm gonna go into how does it work? Because I actually had to read a bunch of the manuals that I had never even looked at before to see how does this tube work? What, what's a flood gun? It's like, I didn't know because I was a user. So 145 pounds, <laughs> 360 watts. It's like, no, this is a beast. Yes, sir. Uh, what accounts for most of the weight? Uh, that's CRT. So it ends up one of my uh, jobs after the Air Force was uh, at Texas Instruments. Uh, and then Compaq and HP and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I mean, I've been doing computer design uh, for dozens of years. We went to a uh, Mitsubishi factory because we needed a CRT, or I mean, a CRT factory. They had barrels of the CRTs that failed, tests or leaked or whatever. And looking inside, the faceplate of a CRT, the big ones is inches thick because of the pressure. It is actually trying to hold it together and keep it from imploding for the vacuum uh, that they pull in the tube. 
And so it's like the bigger the tube, the more ways it's all in the front. The rest of the tube is fairly thin glass. Yes. Um, did you upload the uh, PDF online? Uh, yeah, I, well, I sent it to uh, Jay, and so he's got the PDF of the material. So that tube is probably a third of the weight. Uh, it's a steel chassis. Uh, what, what's the size of it? This is a 19 inch screen. So 1979, the first screen, that 4051 that I used was 11 or 12 inch with a flat faceplate. Uh, it ended up in doing the research on trying to repair this. Tektronix built their own tubes. And you go, well, why did they have to build tubes? There's people building tubes. They had been in the 60s. Their first storage tube scopes used RCA or Dumont was another manufacturer of the CRTs and televisions. And they had been getting them to supply the tubes for the scopes. But the vendors said, we've got a limit the production. We can't make the tube that you want in the volume you need. Yes, sir. Is that a steel cage around it? This is a steel cage that those bars are steel. It's surrounded in steel, you know, an EMI shield or I mean RF uh, kind of thing. So that's all part of the beastly construction. I mean, it is built like a tank. I have to imagine that 6,000 volts that required plenty of shielding. Yeah. yeah, but the actual, I don't have pictures from the other side, but it's just a cable. I mean, every one of the signals to the end cap is in a single cable uh, that I've got dressed away from the board ribbon cables and low voltage power supply wiring. Uh, but yes, it is, it's built like a tank, but the military used it. They put 4052 on submarines, and we've got a guy on the 4052 or 4051 Facebook group that has pictures of this is where they were doing the sonar. And basically, he was a programmer on the 4052. They would write their own basic programs to try to come up with where should we point. So instead of doing the math by paper or slide rule, it's like, no, it was a computer on the submarine itself. Yes, sir. Okay, th therefore, that all that shielding that was probably like a military requirement, right? It could have been the, the componentry uh, for military. They may have required military components instead of the standard uh, uh, components. Any signals radiating out from being picked up. Yeah, yeah. so... No, no telling. I don't, I don't know because, uh, but they were used in the military. They were put on vehicles. So it was designed to take shock and vibe and it survived a couple of trips from Houston. I drove, uh, from Houston to BCF West in Mountain View in 2022, taking my 4054. And so I was like, no, it'll, it'll make the trips. Uh, so 64K of basic ROM, 64K of DRAM. Uh, full keyboard, including numeric pad, and it's got on the right side of the keyboard, two thumb wheels. So it's this one, the big screen was designed for CAD. They had been doing CAD on the little screen, hard to do. They wanted two things out of this, and we're going to see the other one, which is if you're doing CAD, what you'd like to be able to do is take the graphic some of these as objects, then drag and drop them on to a floor plan layout, a building design, girders, trees, whatever. And so they designed this one to do CAD. And so it's got some very special features in the graphics, which is why they put in four to five boards uh, running the display. So it is incredibly fast, faster than its cousin. Uh, the 4052 has the identical CPU board set, but it's got the old display board from 75, which took a fixed period of time for every vector. It didn't matter if it's a short vector or a long vector, and that was part of why it was slow. So you could draw pictures, and it didn't matter what the size of the vector was. It was a fixed period of time to get the D to A to settle. They have a totally different design. They built their own D to A converters, but it's not... It's not simple. There's some high frequency clock going in there. And so short vectors are very fast. 
Long vectors take longer. So what's the other part of the design? That board in orange on the right is a GPU. It's a graphics processor. It's another 16-bit CPU. In this particular case, it's a Signetics 8x300 bipolar CPU. And you go, what the heck's an 8x300? It was a CPU that would been that it was used in hard disk controllers. Incredibly fast. And so I believe this is the second generation. Does anybody here have you seen Battlestar Galactica, the original TV series? Okay, I did, loved it. They had 4051s in there, but they had screenshots that things were moving. So Battlestar Galactica was moving across the screen, and it's like they did that with a 4081 that was introduced in 77, which had a mini computer driving the screen, so it was a combination of the graphics terminal and the mini computer, and they gave the mini computer graphics assist where it could have objects designed and move around. Not a successful product, but I think the designer says, we got to put this in the 4054. And that's what he did. So there's its own ROM, 32K of RAM, and my machine's got this, and I know of three machines in the world that are this board in a 4054 A, and I'll tell you what the A is. The A is their original basic. The introduction of this computer had the same basic commands, no change. The customers started complaining about basic and said, we need structured programming context, do while, those kind of things. A series had the additional instructions and they changed the microcode and it's like so it's the last of this series uh, a thousand vectors a second can be drawn by this board which is programmed from the basic side and so it's like it's incredible it takes full advantage of the hardware basic even on this 4054 if you're drawing lines in basic they get scaled. So they have a window command, a viewport command, which part of the screen are we going to draw on? And you want the left side to be 10 units and minus 10, you know, with zero in the middle, or you want three weeks. And so the scaling requires multiple floating point computations for each vector. So why basic is slow drawing. That guy is sitting on the display ribbon cables right in the middle. And when he's told, remember the stuff happening on the display bus, which is 12-bit X, 12-bit Y, move, draw, and until we tell you to stop building the object. So in basic, you go draw lines, print text, and that board is just copying the final result, the D to A integer data not the floating point original, and putting it in memory. And so my Cylon attack demo, I draw the Cylon telling the board this is going to be object 10 or whatever number, uh, up to 65K, and it gets moved around on the screen with basic commands. So that was what you needed for CAD. The CAD programs would build custom objects and I've got a demo of this board showing a tech logo. And you can drag it around the screen. Smooth as silk. And then hit a button. Boom. It gets stored on the screen in green. That's all it does. So it's like Atari had a hardware design, a hardware accelerator for the 6502 in Asteroids. 6502 would tell it. Here's the sides of the asteroid. Draw it over here, here. Give me three of these. And so it's a display list coprocessor. Very similar to what a GPU does. Without the option 30, the 4054 only has the capability of drawing a couple of lines before it looks like they're blinking. Okay, so it's like the red in the tube, and we'll get into the color tube, 
is very short persistence. So it doesn't do you much good to have this GPU and not have the color tube. But how does the storage stuff even work? I found out and thought you guys would appreciate it. So this is a cross section of one of their pictures of the inside of the storage tube. There is one gun. So off on the left side, is there a laser? Yeah, the top. Just press it. Yeah, hold it. That guy, writing gun. So the electrons are formed inside the cathode and there is a grid exiting the cathode that's the control grid for just on off. So typically for a vector to move, turn off the beam, get the D-days to point to the uh, vector, and then turn on the beam and leave it on until we stop. Okay, and then move the XY across the screen to do the draw. In the middle, and not shown, for the oscilloscopes, it's such a tiny deflection angle, they can use electrostatic, two electric plates, and just apply a voltage to them to cause the beam to move. These 19-inch tubes are too big for that. They've got a coil, two coils, like what you would see on the back of a regular television tube. And so I don't show it in the diagram, but the deflection plates, the second thing here, are the ones that are moving that beam. Now, the coils have inductance and all sorts of properties that are bad for linearity. So they've got electronics on those display boards that straightens out the vectors and does pin cushion correction. I mean, you end up with bowed vectors and stuff and all that gets straightened out by electronics that are adjustable. Pretty amazing. But, all right, so the writing beam at six kilovolts goes all the way to the faceplate to hit the phosphor, and that's it. Once it draws a line, the beam's off. <laughs> but I can still see the picture. That green does not stay glowing. It can't. <laughs> None of the phosphors can glow for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And so the secret of the storage tube is something that I didn't have any familiarity with. Come on, laser. There it is. In the middle are these guns that they said flood guns. And I was going, what is a flood gun? The flood guns shoot a spray of electrons at lower energy than storing on the entire faceplate. And there's a bunch of them. When those electrons, so the phosphor itself actually stores the charge when it's written by the high energy of the writing beam. But the electrons are just sitting there. They don't energize the phosphor after it's written. The flood guns do. The flood guns are sending additional electrons and they actually cause more energy in everything that's been written, but not enough to store any additional lines and it glows. Wow all the time. And so I had no earthly idea that's how it works. Because once you've written a vector, the display, the phosphor is the memory. So Tektronics use the fact that their storage tubes remembered whatever was written to it until you erase it. So the good news is they didn't need graphics memory. They didn't have a video memory board with pixels. It was like, no, they wrote to the screen. Forget it. Fire and forget. Incredible. The flood guns are continuously working while the beam's writing. I mean, they're, they're only turned off or set to low after two minutes of not typing, and the screen goes dim. So it's a screensaver because they didn't want the screen to be on 
all day long, they would burn the phosphor. So basic ROMs are sitting there timing out and going, okay, dim it. And so that screen will go to, well, you can barely see anything, but you can wake it up. So you hit the shift key, boom, flood guns back on. That screen, everything you put on it is still there, but they didn't have to rewrite it. They just had to re-energize it. Cool. Option 30, that coprocessor, is completely different because what it's trying to do is have an object that doesn't store. So the flood guns, there's nothing of the Cylon that gets stored on the phosphor. It's like, huh? So what it does, it's doing refresh. And this is exactly what happens in the Atari Asteroids arcade machines is their little digital video processor is sitting there with a list of things to do and keeps all the objects redrawn. It has to redraw those because phosphors don't store visually. And so option 30 is like a coprocessor uh, that's in the Atari Arcade and they picked 37 and a half hertz as the refresh rate. Yeah, question? visual difference between the uh, stored vectors on the dynamic is one brighter than the other? Excellent. It ends up that in the 4054 without the color display, option 30 is requesting lower energy for those vectors. It's dimmer. So in the green tube, you have nice stored vectors, and then you have a dim object that kind of floats around, but it's green. It's just not as bright because they're not putting out enough energy to store it in the phosphor. So the customers in 79 said, love it. It's fast. You got to make that refresh brighter. <laughs> And the engineers knew we can't. We're making the green as bright as we can. We don't want to burn it in. Okay? Can't get any brighter. What are we going to do? Let's finish this one. This is green vectors stored. So I did a picture of the DeLorean time machine because I also love uh, all the sci-fi movies and Back to the Future. Would have been in the same period as these machines. Uh, so basically this image is stored in stored mode, does not use option 30. It does use, and we'll look at the video here, uh, it does use an option ROM to draw the vectors. Because basic drawing this, it'd probably be 20 minutes. <laughs> And nobody's got 20 minutes to look at a vector picture. And so let's click. So I made this one from a JPEG. Need somethings had posted this on Imgur. It allegedly that the DeLorean was created by the DeLorean Motor Company. DMC is on the grill in the front of the car. The stainless steel body was used to create the time machine for the movie Back to the Future. And it has gold wing doors. In the movie, we heard that it took, uh, Dr. Brown said it took 1.21 gigawatts of power from a plutonium reactor to charge the flux capacitor behind the seats, which you can see in the upper right corner uh, through the windshield. All right, Dan. When the car reached 88 miles an hour to travel back in time, the pronunciation of gigawatts is how a scientific advisor for the film pronounced it, according to the interview with the DV animated making of. Uh, Video. In the DVD of Back to the Future. The Wikipedia article on the DeLorean time machine says that the car's speedometer in the dashboard 
only went up to 85 miles an hour. <laughs> the production crew chose 88 miles an hour because it looked better on the digital speedometer that they put in front of the dash uh, in the movie. This image it is the largest in this video at 465 K bytes, which you 465 k bytes. You ain't got but 64k of RAM. What do you do with that much? Now we're back. Okay, so uh, the vectors are being drawn by an option ROM, fast graphics option ROM. Uh, the engineer that designed it uh, had been working on the terminals. He hadn't worked on the 4050s, but he worked with the people doing the basic ROM and they told him how to build an option ROM. And he wrote code that takes every one of the vectors, which in this image are 10 bit, not 12, uh, X 10 bit Y and one bit of move and draw and said, look, if we take on the terminals, they built their own language for vectors but it was multiple characters and it depended on, well, if, if you're too close, you can use just one byte to describe a Y shift or an X shift. It's like really complicated. He said, let's make this brute simple. Three bytes per vector. Two bytes are going to get the 20 bits of X and Y. One bit is going to be move and draw. And all that ROM's got to do is set the guns fire, set the guns fire quick as a bunny. So that's how that was drawn much faster than the basic language would have drawn it. Uh, color. You saw orange flashes as it was drawn lines and that was because the color tube has red and green <laughs> phosphor in it, not just green. And this is in order to get that refresh processor to be able to have an object that's easily recognizable on the screen. It's orange or red versus green. So they added color just for option 30 to do its job. Well, red is actually takes less energy to turn on a red phosphor than green. That would have been bad because it would have stored at any energy level. So if you're trying to write just persistent vectors with the energy to do green, you don't want the red to stay on. So what you saw was a flash of the red phosphor glowing when the writing beam was doing its job. But from a flood gun perspective, nothing is stored in the green phosphor. And so their beam energy is too low to turn on red, too low to write anything to the green. It's just causing the screen to glow where the electrons are stored in the phosphor. I got this computer actually at VCF West 2022. Knew it was quote color, but figured there's just orange and green. But when I was looking at repairing the computer, I found an article during the color announcement in, I think it was 82. And the article said, we could actually do another color. If you draw over with a dynamic vector, over a stored vector, it's kind of a greenish yellow color is what they said. And I said, oh, I got to see this. So once I got the computer working, I wrote my little basic program to try to duplicate what they were saying. And so Tektronix marketing, I mean, that's all they did. Uh, the demo tape for this option board was for the original green 4054 with option 30 didn't have any color and so they didn't take advantage of what was being described in by the marketing guy. So wrote my little basic program and what I had found in once I got this computer I said I got to do asteroids. I got a coprocessor. My gosh, I got a game to write. And so when I drew 
the asteroids in my first attempt at the program. I drew one vector object for each of the asteroids, the ship, and it's kind of a dim green, okay? And I said, it's supposed to be bright. And it's like, okay. You put two objects at the same place in option 30 in the list and oh, twice 37 and a half. It gets re-energized and that red changes color and you go, how could it be anything other than red? Well, <laughs> it's actually driving the green on, but not to storage. So the color shifts and I said, ah, oh, can I do more? <laughs> and so I've got a demo, uh, but let's see if, well, it's in one of the slides. So I said, okay, asteroids, I mean, it is a complicated game and to write it in basic versus assembly it's probably not going to work very good. So I keep working on asteroids and then going, how about something simpler? Uh, Battlestar Galactica. They had in the show targeting circles and the Viper pilot is chasing the Cylon and shooting. And I said, oh, I got to do that. That sounds like an easier game. And so I draw targeting circles in basic. They're stored never have to touch them again okay i needed that cylon to float around the screen and then i would shoot when it was at the center and so i've got the game running and let's see what it looks like here in my tech vectors channel on youtube and there's links in the pdf to my channel Today we're going to How do I get full screen? Battlestar Galactica Cylon attack game. All right, I've got to catch this Cylon. And last I got that sound effects. I'm moving my joystick. Bring it bring it on. But some of them scoring in refresh mode moving off to the side and I can't get the joystick to bring them into the center. And Intentionally. So I get misses for those. Let's see if I get another hit. Yes. This one can I bring it in? All right. Ooh, a little fast. <laughs> and so it looks it looks simple but the people that have tried it so one i found that the joystick i think i mentioned that the joystick that tektronix put a port for on the back of the computer and the thumb wheels turn off the video and use the display d to a's to successive approximation find what's the xy voltage Okay, return to basic. You've got to be kidding me. So it makes no sense to have a tight game loop basically flicker that Cylon on and off. I said, I got to make me a joystick, a game pad for this machine. This is pitiful. It won't work for asteroids either. Uh, so I also have a Vectrex consumer vector machine and I said, all right, it's got an XY analog pot and four buttons. Let's hook it up. And I hooked it up. Uh, and that's what I'm firing here because using keys is like only 10 keys interrupt. But it's like there are little bitty keys up the top of the keyboard. So game pads are much better. So I've got a game pad at the uh, booth. Vectrex game pad hooked to my Arduino that is emulating the tape drive. Because the other problem with these computers of the 70s is they had 3M quarter inch tapes. What a pain. One, they're slow. So I've got in my Monopoly game uh, that I'm demoing over a hundred Monopoly card files. It would take minutes to seek in a tape to one of those files, but the flash drive 
uh, that I designed is running Arduino uh, code and is basically emulating the tape drive that they had on GPIB. So their basic had the ability to put, for instance, at five to get to device five on GPIB. You could have 32 different devices. They had all sorts of stuff that they had built. So the Arduino is listening for address five. And then the question is, how did Tektronix command peripherals? Because when they introduced GPIB with the 4051, there was no command standardization. Hewlett Packard and Tektronix did two totally different things to talk to the plotters and talk to the digitizers. And so what Tektronix decided to do is they extend the GPIB attention frame, which is the very first thing on the bus by the controller, says five, and then they put out a second number, a second address that they called a secondary address. And there's a table of 32 different basic commands mapped to secondary addresses. The command for move, the command for draw, the command to print, the command for input is a number. So that's what the flash drive uses to figure out what's the system wanting. Do they want a piece of data from a file? Do they want me to find a file? Are we closing a file? Are we loading a file? And it's like, sweet. So with the tech service manual, uh, I worked with a collaborator in the UK who had written Arduino programs to do basic controller for people that have old instruments on GPIB. There aren't any card slots for the GPIB cards anymore. So he wrote Arduino code that takes serial from USB, serial commands, and does a GPIB command to your digital voltmeter, uh, power supply, whatever it is that they did instrumentation equipment. So I asked him, can you do the reverse? I need a device that receives a command to return data to the controller. Got it done. So that's what's also uh, in my exhibit. And so it has some pins left. I found an Arduino board that had enough pins not only to drive GPIB at 5 volts directly, enough pins left over to do two analog inputs for the pot and four buttons. And all it is, wired up the Vectrex controller, got me an extension cable, cut it, wired it, and wrote a couple of lines of Arduino code uh, to add a command uh, that doesn't exist, a command 31, and it returns X, Y, A, B, C, D buttons. And so my basic program, just one line says, grab the data. I use the pot data and the button data to fire. It's like, now I got me a game pad. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, Vectrex has a number of people that have put adapted other uh, early joysticks, flight sticks. And so I have a flight stick that I really want to put in there to do Star Wars and other games. And it's like, yeah, this is a lot of fun. So we did that. It's back to Chrome still. Damn Mac. Uh, so price. This thing was expensive in the 70s because it had a bunch of stuff in it. So $20,000 at 32K a RAM. And you add in the extra 32K for $800, put in $3,300 for an option 30 board, and $5,315 over the 20 to get color. That tube, $29,500 later, you're driving away with a wonderful machine, which in 2024 dollars, $95,000 worth of gear, <laughs> I'm in that box. Damn. Not counting my flash drive. I would have charged 5000 for the flash drive. <laughs> So there it is. It's at BCF Southwest. Uh, color. I said I could get five colors. 
There we go. This one doesn't have the colored text that's in my demo uh, now, but basically you write some text or draw some vectors. I got triangles and text, and then you draw over it with option 30. Take the same text and draw it in quote red. If you draw one time, it goes from a fairly dim red text and vector to orange. Pretty, pretty recognizable. This is what you'd want for a CAD object. Write on it twice. And the text, and that's not in this demo picture, this lime green text goes yellow. It's like they got a whole span of colors. It's all analog. That beam multiple times is adding enough energy briefly to go across the whole color curve between red and green. It's like this is amazing. So you'll see this demo. Uh, here's the exhibit. You'll be able to recognize the poster if you didn't see the big beast sitting there. So it's running Cylon attack. So questions? Stunned disbelief. He's like, no way, man. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, where did you buy yours again? Yes, yeah, so eBay. <laughs> when the buy-in was good. So 2000 or 1999, we're talking about 15 years after production. Okay, so people have decided, yeah, I don't need it anymore. Scrapped it or whatever. My first one, and that's, that's not this one, the first one, uh, had a Caltech sticker. I think the young man I bought it from had been a Caltech, bought it in their store or picked it up. They said, surplus auction, who knows? whatever, who knows? And when I got it, it's like, I left that sticker on there. It's like, my goodness, this one, I got a buddy and I knew from his website that he had pictures of four with the color tube, two green ones. And I said, Bob, do any of them work? No, don't work. Bob is a big collector. So I said, and he's near Mountain View. So I told Bob, Bob, I'm coming to VCF Southwest. I'm bringing some RAM sockets and a diagnostic ROM pack. I want to get one of yours working. I got to see this. One day, DRAMs, that's all it was, both in the main boards and in the option 30. And so the Bob was happy. He was going to be exhibiting his analog computer at BCF West. I said, hey, Bob, uh, can I fix one? And he says, well, I'm working on my analog computer here. Just you get it working fine. And so got it fixed the second day and said, Bob, I got the green one in my Honda Fit on an aluminum cart, a mag liner, cut down so I can get it up ramps into the Fit. And that's how I brought it here. And I said, Bob, I'll, I'll trade you. I got a green one for a maroon one. So that's how I got this one. It is, has got to be a lab queen. Ah, crap. There we go. There is a fan hole and a fan in the side of the unit that is not in production. That fan's blowing right on that option 30 board because it was adding more heat right on top of all the other logic boards. Uh, well, actually, Remove that uh, the cable to the fan because it was making too much noise. Uh, but it's like, yes, this one had to be something out of the lab. Had to. Because uh, not a production unit. It's got a little sticker. So it ends up the 4054A was a ROM. It was more than a ROM upgrade. The power supply. The deflection amplifier. Another video board. And... Not only the display, uh, 
all have to be changed out. So it was a factory installed option only, not a field option. And so 4054A right here, it says 4054 and there's a little A sticker. And it's like, that's what they did if the field mod for the A series which changed out the ALU ROMs, changed out an I.O. board, put in a TI, uh, GPIB ASIC, instead of having uh, discrete GPIB buffers that were driven by software. So A-series, sweet. But that was the end of the line. So I think 85 was the last production year. PC, drove it out of business. Uh, too bad. Any other questions? Yeah. So, um, just to get an idea of the capability, the Cylon demo, you said that was like basic? Uh-huh. That's all it runs, except I do have an assembler program. So, in 82 or so, they published a tape, and I got the tape from Living Computer Museum, and uh, dumped it, and basically the uh, the assembler program is in BASIC, but creates and describes all of their instructions in the microcode. So they did not only every one of the Motorola 6800 opcodes, but because they doubled the memory map, they had to do weird things to bounce between ROM and RAM space. So they had some special commands, uh, which is why the ROM packs had to be special for this guy uh, and weren't the same as the 4051 uh, ROM pack. But I have done some assembly. I've taken their example programs and Motorola Micbug, compiled it and put in the address of the, uh, the serial interface. So I could do assembly. It's been a long time. <laughs> and so the basic program was telling option 30 the XY position to change to. So that was all I was doing is updating. They had a set point command to say, yep, here's the new XY for object 42. Since there's two of them, it's actually moving one and then moving the second one. And they had put in the manual that if you do two objects like that, the animation is smoother because otherwise you turn off an object and turn it back on. It's 37 times a second. So it would have waited until the next 37 times, you know, 20 milliseconds or whatever. Uh, to get back to that object. But if you got two of them, then only one gets turned off probably in one cycle and basic is telling it, turn, you know, move it, turn on the other one. So you get smooth animation by doing two of them uh, and tracking. So it almost works like interpolation then with one moving and the other ones that's still there, like there's not a frame missing. Right, right. And so when I first did it, I only had the one object and one, it was kind of dim red. And two, it would visibly flicker as it was moving. So uh, the two objects solved all that. Uh, so their display list, it ends up, it doesn't matter how many objects are on the list. After they've displayed the things on the list, and some of them can be blinking. They'll do that in hardware. It's like they wait until the end of the 37 and a half times a second to do the list again. And that's why the two objects, only one would get turned off in list processing, typically basic, just not fast enough to get it 30 times a second, but get better, better animation. So each dynamic object is individually refreshed then? Each, each one is individually drawn. It is single threaded and it'll do object, 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 object down the list and then wait, repeat. And uh, so that's how that works. We're done. Thank you, everybody.